And now, another showing of Drop the Dead Donkey. This episode was originally broadcast in a hot week in August, when the inquiry into the Guildford Four convictions gathered pace, and Iraq's continued occupation of Kuwait put Britain on a war footing. We seem to be running out of angles on how to cover this bloody gulf crisis. Well, how about if we did a piece focusing on the psychology of Saddam Hussein? Well, you know the kind of piece, sir. We get a psychiatrist to discuss his megalomania, his psychotic tendencies, his tiny penis. You don't know if Hussein's got a tiny penis. <laughs> I'm sorry, George, but any man who erects 80 feet high posters of himself on every street corner has definitely got a tiny penis. <laughs> you ask me, all these oil rigs in Kuwait are just one big willy substance. <laughs> well, that's the answer to the crisis then, really, isn't it? We just get Claire Rayner to give Saddam a ring and reassure him that size doesn't matter. <laughs> Look, can we please get off the subject of tiny penises? <laughs> no. The aspect of Saddam's character that I find... Well, the man's totally mad. You'll never believe what he's done now. What? He's played on, slashing outside the off stump. <laughs> Bloody David Gower! Keeping abreast as usual, eh, Henry? What's the latest military situation in Kuwait? Well, according to Peter Snow on Newsnight, the whole of the Gulf region is completely overrun with dinky toys. Uh, Can we be serious, please? Uh, we should cover the fact that our troops could be attacked by Iraqi chemical weapons. Yes. It'd be horrendous, wouldn't it, if British soldiers came back scarred by poison gas? Yeah. Where would Thatcher hide them during the victory parade? <laughs> Let's not get cynical, David. <laughs> Now, any general comments on our war coverage so far? Yes, it is very lacklustre. I should be out there. If it was me, I'd be on the front line covering the fighting. You'd be on the front line starting the fighting. <laughs> right, any more offers? What about the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh? Oh, come on, we've milked that one to death. You only don't like it because you can't pronounce it. Dear girl, which one of the two of us is the newsreader they use in schools as a guide to English pronunciation? My diction is unimpeachable. Yes. How many letters of complaint did we receive when you got the Turkish Kurds back to front? <laughs> yes, well, perhaps if we could move on. George. George, my piece on Nazi football fans. It's very important now that English clubs are allowed back into Europe. And what exactly is sensationalist about it? Well, usually victims of violence are only interviewed after the attack, not before and during as well. <laughs> Now, I, I'm not here, as you know. <laughs> right after Sir Royston's friendly takeover, I made it crystal clear that decision-making was a ground level rather than an executive input. Nevertheless, as the man in the street who's not in the room, I have to say, I liked it. Uh, I must say, there's some really great camera work right in there amongst the hooligans. That was Jerry, wasn't it? Yep. How is he now, Damien? Oh, he's much better. He's off the drip. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I really feel that that idea... Yes, well, of course, I'm not saying I'm not putting it out. I'll almost certainly use it, probably, but I might need to re-edit it, maybe. And that is final, possibly. <laughs> yes, well, uh, if that's all, uh, meeting over. Thank you, everyone. Uh, George, Henry, Alex, can I borrow you just for a moment? Dave, what's this word that the Americans keep using instead of blockade? Interdiction. Ah, that's right. Yeah. Presumably it's not going to escalate into a war, but a police action. And it won't end up as a nuclear holocaust, but as a bit of a Barney. <laughs> I'm a man of few words. All I have to say is that in my role as a support module to you in the front line of the sharp end decision makers, it's been decided to upgrade our market profile by hiring a new newscaster. What? To work alongside Henry. I've not been consulted on this. And provided George is in full agreement. Oh, for God's sake. Who is it, anyway? Sally Smedley. Sally Smedley? Sally is an experienced journalist. She was a children's presenter at Radio Leicester, devising... <laughs> Devising, compiling and presenting, smile along as Sally. <laughs> she did three months on the sofas at Breakfast TV, and she's worked as an investigative journalist. On John Craven's news round. 
Gus, Susan is a highly experienced and deeply professional newsreader. Sally Smedley is a... A bimbo. No, 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 she isn't. Oh, no, you're right. I forgot. And she was expelled from the National Union of Bimbos for being too dim. <laughs> You've only gone for her because she's attractive. Is she? It certainly is. <laughs> Henry, try not to drool on the photo. Well, I suppose she is quite good-looking, but if anything, that counted against her. <laughs> the real question is... Does little Miss nagorno Karabakh out there stay? Well, Susan, I feel sure, will be eager to push forward the parameters of her career into new and fresh challenges in exciting fields outside this organisation. Oh, you're giving her the boot. Good. <laughs> yes. Susan has worked with us for 15 years. Are you seriously going to go out there and tell her she's being fired? Oh, no, George. I think it would be wrong of me to interfere in any way in your operation. I'm not telling you. I'll tell her. No, no, no. Gus, <laughs> no. yes. this decision has been reached entirely without consultation. George, I've told you before, I am not here. You are totally in control. And if you want to review this situation when Sally arrives... When does she arrive? In about 15 minutes. Then 15 obviously... Fifteen minutes?! <laughs> we had to snap her up quickly, George, when we had the chance. But she's only here for a trial period. And if at any point you say she goes, she goes. All right, but I'm holding you to that. And another thing, no publicity. I don't want the tabloids kicking down the door on this. George, I promise you, it'll be terribly low-key. I'm surprised Gus didn't hire the Red Arrows. Oh, they're fully booked, apparently. <laughs> well, I suppose we mustn't prejudge her. Maybe she'll turn out to be really nice. Maybe she'll fit in well with the team. Maybe she's Mother Teresa of Calcutta in disguise. <laughs> What's that? Nothing. What are you running a book on now? It's Henry's first words to Sally. It's seven to one, you're an attractive woman. Ten to one, if I said you had a beautiful body, would you hold it against me? <laughs> And a thousand to one, fancy a shag. <laughs> Where is Henry, anyway? Uh, having a drink in his dressing room. Oh, well, in that case, fancy a shag's down to ten to one. <laughs> Dave, you're wasting off his time, you know. Absolutely. I'll have a fiver on you're a very attractive woman. You know, I have always said it. If you're nice to them, they'll be nice to you. Oh, you're so right, Gus. Mm. And I was saying as much to Princess Di only the other day. Isn't, <laughs> uh, isn't she delightful? Yes, isn't she? I met her at a charity fashion show, Frocks for Famine. I auctioned my hat for Eritrea. Uh, Sally Smedley, George Dent. George. The man who makes his decisions. <laughs> Dave Charnley, Dave. Damien Day, and uh, Alex Pates. Oh, hello, Alex. Wouldn't be a darling. Give me a cup of coffee, would you? <laughs> You're right, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm the assistant editor, not the coffee fetcher. Oh, I'm sorry. Fancy mistaking for an underling. Can't imagine why I did that. <laughs> anyway, who's next? <clears throat> ah, um, Henry Davenport, <laughs> Sally Smithley. Pleased to meet you. What's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? <laughs> I'm an experienced journalist. I'll follow up to that like bomb it. in Nagorno-Karabakh. Ah, the Russian place. <laughs> what did I tell you? The next Peter Sissons. <laughs> no. Good evening. I'm Sally Smedley, and here is the news. In the House of Commons uh, today... I'm sorry, is there a problem? Uh, yeah. Sorry, um, Sally, I, I know this is just a rehearsal, but um, here we don't introduce ourselves before we read the news. <laughs> if you could just, you know, read what's on the autocue. I thought it was nice and cosy. Yes, <laughs> well, I do. I know, let's have some China ducks going up the wall. <laughs> nice crackling fire behind the news desk, and you can toast crumpets while Henry reads out the unemployment figures. Look, is this damn silly rehearsal over? No, it is not. We just tried to give Sally a sense of our style. George, George, purely by way of information, Sally's idea for an intro is exactly the sort of informal approach Sir Royston likes. Yes, well, he's going to have to start watching someone else's news because it's certainly not happening here. I like that. <laughs> You've the guts to take personal responsibility for a decision. In history, I've always admired people like that, people with that sort of courage. Charles I, Joan of Arc, <laughs> Mary, Queen of Scots. <laughs> They were all executed. Well, technically, yes. <laughs> but they won the moral argument. 
Excuse me. In the football hooliganism item, the word after chainsaws, shouldn't it read machetes rather than machettes? Yes, it does, yes. No, there's no <laughs> accent over the E. That's because there isn't an accent on the typewriter for the autocue. One at John Craven's news round has one. <laughs> also embedded. Doesn't that have two Ds? She can spell. Yes. <laughs> because otherwise I could read it out embedded in his skull. Wouldn't be very good, would it? Sound very silly. Yes, Sally. Thank you very much. George, big problem. That football club are claiming that Damien got those supporters drunk deliberately. Oh, God. Uh, look, uh, that's all for now, everybody. Uh, thank you, Sally. Right, well, if anyone wants me, I'm at Hatchard's launching my book. <laughs> Your book? Yes. It's all about how the successful woman today can keep fit but stay feminine. I'll bring you back a copy, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Alex, we've got a leak on the Guildford Four inquiry. The Somerset and Avon police say there's a prima facie case against four officers. We won't get convicted, though. Why not? You can't trust police evidence, can you? I think it's a sad reflection on the intellectual capacity of our police force that they can't frame four innocent people without making it completely bloody obvious. Yeah, there is a whisper going round that they're very close to arresting an IRA cell. All right, have you got names? Oh, no, they haven't decided who yet. <laughs> and so I said to Hazeltine, I said, Mike, I said, just answer the bloody question. <laughs> Is that the vintage champagne? See, si. oh, excellent. Uh, you push off, I'll pour it. <laughs> I thought, uh, I thought we'd celebrate your first appearance. Well, it's hardly my first appearance. I'm an experienced, experienced journalist. Oh, yes. You did jolly well today. Oh, thank you. Yes, jolly well, because a lot of girls your age might have uh, felt intimidated presenting alongside a. A newsreader as vastly experienced as me. <laughs> but not you, Sally. Cheers. Of course, I've been at this game a long time, you know. I know. In fact, you're a bit of a heartthrob in our family. Really? <laughs> My grandmother has quite a thing about you. <laughs> really? Yes, well, from your point of view, watching an old war horse like me in action might be rather rewarding. Did you see my interview with uh, Heath in 74? No. Took him to bits. A lot of the commentators said it was me who got in the election. Really? Yes. Uh, do, do you know the secret of political interviewing? No. You must listen very carefully to what they're saying. You must try and understand their point of view, and then you must ask yourself the crucial question. How can I stitch up this lying bastard? <laughs> now, there. There. I mean, some people would pay a lot of money for that sort of advice. <laughs> Actually, do you mind if I give you a bit of advice, Henry? Mm. I'm sorry? Only... You did have a bit of trouble with that item on nagorno Karabakh. You see, you'd enunciate so much more clearly if you opened your mouth that bit wider. What? Yes, that's better. And if you put the tip of your tongue up to the top of your mouth, you'd say the t sound so much more clearly. Quite frankly, my dear, I'd rather put the tip of my tongue into someone else's mouth. <laughs> sounds very unhygienic. Excuse me. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Yes, you are! I just wanted to say, can I have an autograph? Oh, all right, very well. I'm a big fan of yours, Miss Smedley. <laughs> Who should I make it to? Greaseball? Tony, with an I. To Tony. There you are. Thank you, Miss Smedley. <laughs> nice of you to ask me. God, uh, how I hate these grubby little admirers. <laughs> oh, oh. Not, well, where were we? Pronunciation. Oh, it's experience. You know, Sally, I think the combination of a, a lovely little filly like yourself next to a a seasoned anchorman like me could give our newscasts a certain vibrant sexual chemistry. In fact, I think you could benefit from my experience in lots of ways. <laughs> well, Henry, no one can say you're not experienced. In fact, the word I'd use is old. <laughs> old and rattled. Old. Rattled, pushy, arrogant, and quite frankly, so physically repugnant, I'd rather go to bed with a one-eyed syphilitic warthog. <laughs> God, I do love it when women play hard to get. Now, can you believe this? I'm talking about putting up poll tax to make up for the selfish gits who haven't paid any yet. You haven't paid your poll tax. Oh, yeah, that's different. <laughs> I'm not paying on principle because I feel it's a pernicious, undemocratic tax that penalises the disadvantaged in our society. And even more importantly... You're skint. Correct. 
He's in the tabloids. They're still leading on Princess Di wears bikini shock horror. <laughs> <laughs> Henry's fracar in an Italian restaurant. They've all got it. Look. What? Newsroom Romeo's restaurant row. <laughs> Headline Henry's hanky panky havoc. And when the sun's got fork off. <laughs> Why? That's what Sally stuck in his hand, apparently. <laughs> There's a photo of Henry looking completely smashed. When was this taken? Any night in the last 30 years. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yes, can I help you? <laughs> nice meal. <laughs> Do you know I offered to take that woman to bed and she turned me down? Incredible, isn't it? You wouldn't take her for a lesbian, would you? <laughs> Poor girl, probably a hormone deficiency or something. Just because a woman refuses sex with you, it doesn't automatically mean there's something wrong with her hormones. It does in my book. What book's that? Sexual harassment for beginners? <laughs> oh, look at this. They've got it all wrong. I didn't call that waiter a dirty dago. I called him a filthy wop. <laughs> I pride myself on accurate bigotry. Henry! <laughs> ah, Damien, I want a word with you. Yeah, in now. a sec, George. Well, do you sleep with her then? No! Right, that's a ten of you when we... Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> I've got to get 20 off Henry first. Damien, I said now. Yeah, as soon as I get a coffee. Well, I see we've made the headlines this morning. Yes, it's a terrible mess. Eh? Oh, yes, yes, terrible. Very, very sad. <laughs> Are we in any of the other papers? We're in all of them. Oh, dear. Good morning, everyone. Lots more news in Iraq, I see. Well spotted. <laughs> I think we should just drop some nuclear weapons on them. I mean, we've got the H-bomb, they haven't. Thank you, Perez de Cuellar. <laughs> Damien, in here, now. Listen, George, I did not buy those thugs as much as a half a lager. I got accounts to send up your expenses. Did you? <laughs> yes. They include a receipt for 172 cans of kestrel, three flagons of cider and eight bottles of whiskey. Yeah, well, it was during that hot spell that we had. <laughs> Oh, look, all right, George, it loosened their tongues. Loosened their fists, if Jerry's anything to go by. 172 cans of kestrel. How many of them were there? Eight or nine. <laughs> now, look, Damien. George, these people are Nazis. Now, any tactic is valid if it exposes them for what they are. That is my job. Your job is to report the news. It's just like that time during the World Cup when you got all those football fans drunk so they'd abuse Colin Moynihan. <laughs> George, you do not need to get people drunk to make them abuse Colin. Oh, my God! Oh, God, what's happening now? Sally has just discovered that Henry's fed all her copies of Slim Along a Sally through the paper shredder. <laughs> you wait, George. From now on, it's going to be World War Three out there. Oh. I'm sure it'll all blow over. Just give them a couple of days. They'll be feeling much more relaxed. On a day when the crisis intensified in the Gulf and Iraq... There you are, you see. They're looking much more relaxed. The border with Iran, that right. is the news. We'll be back at six. Well, tight ass, you were total crap, as always. <laughs> and so are you, you brain-dead geriatric dinosaur. <laughs> Dent, that car's got to go! She is useless. Yesterday, we were discussing the cabinet and I asked her what she thought of Portillo. She said she'd been there on her holidays, but she preferred a Malfi. <laughs> she's a monster. I mean, she's been here three days, and already she's called Martin in Sound a tone deaf retard, and she wants Gillian in makeup fired because she says she's too ugly. Miss Lu I do understand a lot of your complaints. However, Gus has just given me a set of overnight figures, which would seem to suggest she's increasing our ratings considerably. Oh, right, which is obviously the prime consideration. I know, let's get Mel Gibson to read the news in a black leather jockstrap while Patsy Kensett simulates sex with our new weatherman, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Look, George, it's no use trying to pretend this isn't happening. Now, Gus said she was here for a trial period and the final decision was yours. It's time you made it. George, Alex is absolutely right. <laughs> in that case, let's put the water story in at number 18. Yeah. This hosepipe band's driving me mad. I hope it ends soon. 
On Sunday, Margaret got me to make 42 separate trips around the garden with a watering can. <laughs> and every time a helicopter flew overhead, she ran out and shouted, Stand still! <laughs> Isn't there anything else? Yeah. Another rise in the number of suicides in prison. Well, that's one way to reduce overcrowding, I suppose. Number 32. <laughs> George! Skipper! You wanted a word? Oh, yes, Gus. Look, he wanted to tell you that yes, he's made the okay. decision... Yes, I'll handle this. Thank you, Alex. Yes, I wanted to tell you, Gus, that I've made the decision over Sally. I feel she's wrong, she's unpopular, and I feel she should go. Fine, George. Well, you're the editor. Yes, well, that's right, I am. <laughs> I mean, she's difficult and very rude. Everyone hates her. She's totally despised by the staff. She's deeply... <laughs> deeply unpopular with the... Another big statement from President Bush, from inside a bunker. A bunker? Yeah. Just off the 13th green. <laughs> when the going gets tough, the tough go golfing. <laughs> hey, great news about the bonus. Thanks. <laughs> Another cup of coffee, Sally. No, don't worry, I'll... <laughs> what bonus? Well, didn't I tell you? Everyone's getting quite a substantial bonus. What for? For the ratings going up. I've memoed all the staff saying with Sally's arrival putting up the viewing figures, I felt everyone should benefit. It's nice to see so many happy faces, isn't it? Now, you were saying about firing her. Yes. Your decision, as I say. Still, I know you're a man who can face unpopularity. Oh, look, someone's bought her some flowers. He has made his decision. How about extending her trial period? For how long? About three years? <laughs> Certainly not. OK, George, but when she goes, bang go the ratings and bang go the bonuses. But don't worry, I'm sure the staff won't hold you personally responsible. Look, George has told you, Gus, Yes, that he... Gus, that's right. I'm not taking Sally on for three years. Two years. All right, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> You're a great decision-maker, George. <laughs> oh, George. Two years of hell. George, I just had a shopkeeper on the line. He says last week Damien wrote him a personal cheque and it bounced. Probably for another 15 barrels of whiskey. Nope. He says it was for 30 copies of Mein Kampf, five Nazi helmets, <laughs> and he says the swastika armbands came back damaged. Sex. <laughs> Next thing we know, we'll have the Nazis in here complaining. George? <laughs> Look, here comes one now. <laughs> George, I've been talking to my agent and he agrees that it is patently absurd I don't have my own personal hairdresser. Yes, well, I, I'll, uh, I'll consider it very carefully. I certainly hope so. George. George, I hear Sally's staying. Yeah, well, she's not exactly staying, staying. Uh, I've only agreed to extending her trial period. Yes, I had to... Uh, Dig my heels in quite hard on that one. Yeah. So, uh, just how long is her trial period, then? Two years. Two years. Damien, two years. You've done it again, you jerry yes! git! <laughs> George, I had you down for five. <laughs> uh. Alex, I'm not totally happy with our wording on the Lord Denning item. We're just reporting the facts, Gus. But he comes across as senile and totally bonkers. We're just reporting the facts, Gus. Look, Denning says it was just a bit of fun. And besides, he's making a perfectly valid point about capital punishment. I mean, all he's saying is, if the Guildford Four had just been hanged, then everyone would have been satisfied. I think the Guildford Four would have been very satisfied. They'd have ended up as a Guildford Nought. Look, Lord Denning is an institution. He should be in an institution. So I don't think we should be too provocative. I'm sure there are other equally important stories we could lead on. Oh, of course, yes. I know, how about Prince Charles hugs woman in Mallorca? Oh, no, no, no. That's more of a third item. 